there is even uh, uh, study data, you know, on how reading compared to, say, watching TV or playing video games on the computer or whatever, how reading affects our brain and even our life and our mood, our emotional state. It stimulates our brain in a different way. It heightens the imagination. And to me, that has always made sense. If I'm watching a a movie on TV or cartoons, uh, we certainly spent lots of time watching Saturday morning cartoons. Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. In those, you park yourself in front of a device. The device supplies all the images, all the colors, all the movements, all the dialogue. And so your brain just sits there and looks at it. Uh, whereas when you're reading a book, say, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, recommend to people here in a minute, uh, uh, say any of the Lord of the Rings books, for mm, example. Mm-hmm. What do the trolls exactly look like? He gives you a little bit of a description, but you don't know exactly. What does uh, what do orcs sound like? You have to sort of fill in the sound. We have the movies now, but of course movies are never as good as as the books they represent, or usually not. Welcome back to Tulsa Time with Bishop Condola. I'm Adam Minahan. Uh, thank you so much for subscribing to Tulsa Time. We have uh, several new reviews. I'd like to shout out to a couple of guys, some anonymous that says, if you live in eastern Oklahoma, this podcast is for you. <laughs> not bad. Not too bad. We have uh, eight reviews, all five stars so far. Oh. So... Uh, not too bad. Don't um, you have eight people in your family? Is that how many? Let's see. I, yeah, I'm, I'm getting pretty close. I think I'm at seven. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Bishop, it's great to have you back. It's great to to be back in studio. Yeah, I can offer a shout out today to my youngest brother Chuck on his fiftieth birthday, which is momentous for him, but also for all of the twelve siblings older than him, or eleven siblings, because it means. All of us are now over 50, and so hard to believe that the baby is 50, but there it is. Yeah, and I had a, actually had a chance to meet uh, Chuck and his wife uh, in in, te- in Texas not too long ago. Oh. Or, well, I guess a year I guess a year ago or so. At? Um, the... Uh, at the Red Sea Radio oh, yeah, uh, yeah, fundraiser. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, so it was a lot, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so the last few weeks we've been talking about marriage, you know, re- leading up to marriage. Uh, we're, we're about to approach the summer months, and so we thought, you know, it'd be a good good topic would be just to talk about the importance of reading uh, during the summer month, the importance of like doing. Yeah. Well, I think in terms of keeping people safe and and uh, gainfully entertained over the summer, something like that. Of course, you know, as kids. Uh, we used to play in the street. I mean, we ne- we, we sure. played in the yard some, but we played mostly in the street. And you could do that when you lived in a neighborhood without a lot of traffic and so forth. Uh, one of the things that I noticed when I moved to Austin in 2000, and uh, would have been about 2000 or 2001, to serve as the vocation director for the diocese, I was living in a home that we had set up for pre-seminary students in just an ordinary neighborhood north of town. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, because I was jogging in those years up and down the street in the morning, uh, I saw lots of kids out to catch the bus in the morning. But I never saw them otherwise. Hmm. And I thought, how strange. Where are all those kids? And I suspect they were all in the house playing video games or something. Um, So, you know, I, I just thought it would be fun to talk about a really important alternative or something that would be uh, also valuable for children. Yeah. And uh, so the the basic topic is simply reading. You know, right. one of the things that I tell the kids when I go visit them in the schools is to beware of the screens. You're using screens in the school. That's wonderful. You should use them as tools. 
But beware of the tendency of screens to take over our lives. Adults certainly experience this with the ever-present smartphone and iPad. Here's my iPad right here. You use them for work, but they have a tendency to call on you outside of work and say, pick me up, look at me, do something with me. Even when there may be very many other better things to do, and reading is certainly uh, one of them, reading books, getting into literature, having fun with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a virtue, right? Like studiositas, like to, <laughs> to, to, to study, yeah. you know, is a virtue. But but not Latin, right? But not Latin. No, no, no. <laughs> I would fail. In fact, I'm sure the, the Latin teachers at our Catholic schools right now who, who heard that probably right. laughed at me. But that's okay. They're uh, um, But, you know, the the virtue of, of, of study, you know, is, is important. Um, and, and we were talking a little bit, and I think we even looked up a couple of articles on, uh, I don't remember how we Google searched for it, but uh, something like um, advantages of reading or something like that. And there is even uh, a study data, you know, on how reading compared to, say, watching TV or playing video games on the computer or whatever, how reading affects our brain and even our life and our mood, our emotional state. It stimulates our brain in a different way. It heightens the imagination. And to me, that has always made sense. If I'm watching a, a movie on TV or cartoons, uh, we certainly spent lots of time watching Saturday morning cartoons. Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. In those, you park yourself in front of a device. The device supplies all the images, all the colors, all the movements, all the dialogue. And so your brain just sits there and looks at it. Uh, whereas when you're reading a book, say, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, recommend to people here in a minute, uh, uh, say any of the Lord of the Rings books, for mm-hmm. example. What do the trolls exactly look like? He gives you a little bit of a description, but you don't know exactly. What, does, uh, what do orcs sound like? You have to sort of fill in the sound. We have the movies now, but of course movies are never as good as as the books they represent, or usually not. And I think that's telling. Yes. Well, it makes sense. Um, Here's another example. The movie Interstellar. It attempts, in in a couple of scenes, it attempts to to imitate, I think it's a wormhole or something like that, sort of a time travel. But how can you represent it? on the screen. And so it just comes off being probably cheesy. Yeah. A, a down player. You know, recently I was talking with somebody or maybe a group of students at, at St. Pius about heaven. What is heaven like? If you made a movie about heaven, and of course there's various movies and a lot of them are just comical movies about heaven. But if you made a movie trying to actually depict what heaven is, you would never be, you, you just could not capture it in a way that your mind can uh, imaginatively think about what heaven might be like. And so that's an example of how reading is, has an advantage over other forms of uh, media or entertainment. So, uh, yeah, so we thought we would just talk a little about. Uh, books, I guess, that we enjoy as we're heading into summer. Hopefully, people will have a bit more leisure time when school gets out and so forth. And, uh, of course, kids don't want to read. I guess children these days have reading lists over the summer. Uh, yes, I think so. Schools assign them. Yeah, right? I think so. But uh, I bet the books on those lists tend to be books that are also fictional or entertaining or, or enjoyable. You don't want to have a kid reading a biology textbook over the summer, no. unless the kid loves biology or something. Um, oh, that's another book I should put on here. Um, but uh, yeah, so more leisure time, picking reading that's enjoyable that you will enjoy doing. I find that when I have gotten into a book that I'm really enjoying, I can't wait to find time to sit down and read. read it. Yeah. Um, uh, so. It, it's a great form of entertainment and still building up the mind. I have uh, just finished reading, and of course we just had him here, George Weigel's book uh, on the Second Vatican Council. Mm-hmm. The title of that book is To Sanctify the World. That's a, a more serious book, 
uh, but still one that someone who's really interested in the church and in the, the church's role in the world uh, may find uh, entertaining to read, particularly if you were born after the council, mm. and the council was a long time ago. <laughs> right. So there are many people who may have heard lots of things about the council, but never actually themselves read any of the documents or understood them, even summary form. Mm-hmm. And this is an excellent book to, uh, to help people understand the council, what it was trying to do, what it has done, uh, things that are still left to do from the council. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, also, uh, I've said this to people before, one of my favorite authors is Michael O'Brien. Michael O'Brien yeah. has written a whole slew of Catholic novels, uh, books that are fictional, uh, many of them are apocalyptic in one form or another. They deal with apocalyptic genre. And um, if you want to get into Michael O'Brien, one way to get into Michael O'Brien, if you have more time, like over the summer, is to start with his trilogy. Uh, it's a three books in a trilogy. Strangers and Sojourners is the first of the three. Um, depicts a family growing up in uh, British Columbia in the late... 1800s, um, and it it uh, deals with issues of faith and life, of growing up in the rough and 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 uh, primitive uh, countryside of British Columbia, uh, strangers and sojourners. Then uh, there's a middle book that's smaller called Plague Journal. So here we're getting into themes of of the Antichrist and his effect in the world, and uh, generally the effect of evil and how sometimes it um, rears its head in authoritarian ways against people as it invades governments and so forth. Hmm. And then uh, the final one is called Eclipse of the Sun. So it continues those themes, themes of courage, themes of martyrdom, uh, but uh, sort of especially the middle book. The middle book is literally edge of the seat, 400-page reading. I mean, you'll read that book in two days. You know, you'll, you won't want to put it down. Uh, the others are bigger books and and take longer to read, but still excellent books. So uh, Michael O'Brien, he's written many other books, um, so not just those three, but there are three excellent books to start with. Uh, a lot of people who have read him like Father Elijah. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly because of the holiness in a priest that is depicted in the book, it's mm-hmm. very beautiful. Yeah, as a as a father, whenever so over the summer, we you know we try to keep the kiddos in, on a somewhat of a reading schedule to keep keep them going. And just anecdotally, like when my kids go and, and watch TV, like when we have a movie night or something like that, and you kind of look at them, they're pretty glossy eyed. They're pretty just kind of. St- a stagnant, like just kind of staring, you know, but if you, st- but if you put a book in their hands and you watch them read, mm-hmm. you know, I sit there and, lo- and watch Jude like smile as he's reading, you know, whenever so- something funny he's read or, you know, they- their face animates as they're reading, reading the book and you can, you can kind of see their imagination, their wheels turning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just so, that's so good for, for kids. Sure. Um, and so while uh, obviously movies aren't bad, but um, I think, Books are so so good for for their imagination. Yeah, one of the books that I, I recommend to a lot of uh, parents who have younger kids, especially boys, is a series on print. It's called Prince Martin. Mm. Uh, have you heard of Have, have you heard no. of these? Excellent. Uh, Prince Martin is is great. It's not strictly Catholic, but it has very virtuous themes in it. Yeah. And um, the authors are Catholics from Oklahoma City, Dark Shades of Oklahoma City. Mm. Uh, and it's really well written. Sure. Uh, and it has their uh, very, it's very, they rhyme. Like it, it, the, the um, lines all rhyme. So it's almost, uh, oh, okay. there's a cadence to it. Okay. Um, and it's really well done um, artistically and things like that. And um, my, bo- my boy is just, Every time the new one comes out, just devours it. It's a cartoonish kind of um, uh, books, but they're really good. It's called Prince Martin, and he goes goes around and 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 helps people. And anyway, um, well, it, you it's a, you can get also a book on Stanley Rother, a children's book. That's right. There is a, a children's book, a comic type book mm-hmm. written about Stanley Rother, and that's one that I recommend to parents too. Yeah. Um, 
Catholic Answers has a three book, what they call a. They, I forget the term they use. It we we would call that a comic book. It right. looks like the like old, graphic novel or something. Yeah, graphic novel. I think mm-hmm. that's how they describe it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's three books to the set. the The overarching title is "The Truth Is Out There," and uh, excellent for uh, young ones to read. They would enjoy reading. It's about uh, Christians who are in space and dealing with issues of Christian faith. Yes. In a futuristic space uh, environment and so forth. Yes, my boys uh, love those. In fact, uh, Luke was reading The Truth Was Out There uh, just last night. Ah, excellent. Um, Yeah. And in general, comic books in general, uh, I love to visit uh, half price books. I don't know if we actually even have those stores in Oklahoma. I haven't seen them. Uh, But basically, a used bookstore. Right. And I'll buy... Uh, collections, you know, the treasury books of the Sunday comics. So, for example, Calvin and Hobbes, one of my favorites is Pearl, Pearls Before Swine uh, or Baby Blues or the things that you read in the paper, the comics. They'll put Family them Circus, to- isn't that one? Family Circus. Yep. They'll put them together in collections. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find, I mean, it's excellent for children. Children would just have fun with it and laugh and it's funny. But uh, I find that even for me as an adult, that kind of light reading just before I go to bed, or even while I'm in bed, puts me to sleep right quick. Mm. You know, it's, it's a great way to drift off to sleep with your mind in a very uh, happy place. So uh, comic books are good. Everything from Narnia. Right, right. yeah, that's, Chronicles that's, of Narnia. That's right. your uh, Catholic go-to adventure books. You want young children to know that their natural energy, particularly for young boys, their natural energy uh, and and need to just be doing is a good thing channeled correctly. Right, in the right way, yeah. And so these kinds of books uh, help them to learn about virtue and about chivalry and all of those things that help them to use their energy for the good of others and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um and then also uh, uh, Tolkien. I think we mentioned Tolkien. The Lord of the Rings mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. is a natural one. Um, I also would recommend to parents a um, a series by uh, the, what's called the Theology of the Body Evangelization Team, otherwise known as Tobit. These you can find online. Um and, the, and uh, Monica Ashour, who's the principal there, has put together a book called the, or a series called The Body Matters. So this is uh, a way to teach children all the way up into high school and done in graded levels. So they're age-appropriate mm. books. It helps them to understand human sexuality and their own bodies as gifts from God and how to use the how to understand the body and how to use the body correctly and so forth. And so um, for parents to read those books to children, particularly starting very young, because they they go all the way down to kindergarten level books, um, this is the theology of the body of Pope John Paul II, sort of written in in beautiful drawings and everything in a way for children to to understand and, and use. It's a great way for parents to bond with children over a topic that parents sometimes feel a little awkward awkward about. How do I talk to my kids about this? Well, if you wait till your kids are 15 to talk to them about it... They've already learned. They've already known. Yeah, Yeah. it makes it harder. But if you form a habit of reading these graded books with your children as they're growing up, then the children are learning things along with you, uh, and it opens a, a way for parents to be able to... Uh, talk to children more, more naturally. Yeah, and I think reading to children in general is is so vital. I mean, they, they, it, it's so good for to read to children. Now, whether you're, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, I think as a grandparent, it's a great mm-hmm. opportunity to take you know with your grandkids to sit down and and read them a book. Yeah. Um, just spend you know, oh, we'll go outside and play, but fifteen minutes we're going to read first, and then we can go outside and play. Right. And you'll t- you'll find out that once they get into the book. They'll start asking, no, 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 not fifty. Can we keep? Can we keep going? Can yeah. we keep going? One more chapter. Right. But those are th- those are great family memories. Those are those are yeah. great opportunities to really connect to with your family. Sure. So yeah, 
Um, now, for adults, uh, a fun book to read, just because everything by him is funny, uh, G.K. Chesterton. A lot of people have not met G.K. Chesterton. He was an older uh, English author. He just has such a wit. He does. Uh, such a pithy way of saying things. So uh, he wrote a book called What's Wrong with the World? I think these days uh, many adults find themselves asking what is that very question. What's yeah. wrong with this world? And so he explores issues. Now, he's writing in what, the uh, early 1900s, late Correct. 1800s? Yeah. 1900s. Uh, the issues turn out to be very relevant and very similar to things that we face today. So that's a fun book to read over the summer. Uh, of course, C.S. Lewis many of the things that he's written. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I love the book Mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, uh, again, very thoughtful, pithy uh, writing style. And he also wrote a book that I think is a, a lot of fun uh, called The Screwtape Letters. Mm -hmm. uh, these are purported to be, it's fictional in a way, but of course it's dealing with serious moral and spiritual themes. But uh, in the screw tape letters, Lewis is purporting to have uh, captured secret communiques between a young novice devil who's been assigned his first Christian to corrupt, and he's writing back and forth to his uncle who works in the Bureau of Corrupting Christians or whatever the thing right. is called. And uh, he's one of the head devils. And... Um, He's writing back and forth to Uncle for advice, and Uncle is writing back to him to try to give him advice. Look, this is how you corrupt your Christian. You're going about it all wrong. You need to do this. You need to not do that. Slow and steady wins the race yeah. kind of thing, yeah. And so funny to read, but also you find yourself thinking, oh, boy, that, that's true. Yeah. And then an, a modern update on that theme is done by Peter Kreeft, hmm. Um in his book that's called The Snake Bite Letters. So he uses oh, a similar title, one. The Snake Bite Letters. Uh, so he sort of does a more modern version, but also uh, a lot of fun to read, but also s there's some serious uh, learning in it. And I find reading books like that, if you have not uh, had the habit of reading and you're like, I need to start reading, mm -hmm. those type of books are really good to start out with. Excellent. Uh, because they not only capture kind of your imagination, but they're they're short. They're not very intimidating. Right. And so you, there's something about, at least for me, uh, feeling accomplished. Okay, good. I read that book. Right. You know, instead of a 400, 500 page book that you try to tackle all at once. Like if you can read a book that's 150 page, 150 pages, mm -hmm. and be like, oh, good. I I did that. Sure. Um, it, it just feels like psychologically, I think it, it feels better. It does. Uh, yeah, to be able to know that I'm reading. Right. Here I go. Um, a more serious book that people might nonetheless uh, enjoy reading is by Helen Alvarez. She just uh, released a book mm. that's called Religious Freedom After the Sexual Revolution. Mm. And so she is has a background as an attorney and a law school professor and so forth, serious Catholic, and she's exploring uh, issues of how do we live together as people in a co country. Uh, after the sexual revolution, how do we maintain religious freedom while still trying to respect one another and uh, in a pluralistic society and so forth? So... Um, I haven't actually read her book yet, but I simply am recommending it based on my knowledge of her, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be excellent. Uh, a beautiful book that I read way back during COVID, I think, because it was the year of St. Joseph when I read it, is a book called In the Shadow of the Father hmm. by an author named Dobrzynski, and it's a book on St. Joseph. It's a, a fictional imagining, so it's an imaginative book on what the relationship between Joseph and Mary was like, hmm. how they met, um, how they related to one another, but it's it's largely in Joseph's mind, things that he must have been thinking, and, and it writes it as 
if it's being narrated by him. Hmm. And, of course, all of those are things that we don't know anything about because we have so little to go on about St. Joseph. But it takes what little we do have to know about St. Joseph and what was going on in the culture and in the mind of Jewish, serious Jewish believers at the time, and fills in those blanks and does it in an imaginative way that's really beautiful to contemplate. Hmm. Uh, one of the books that I think is very interesting, it's an older book. Well, I say older book. I think it came out in um, late 80s, early 90s uh, by a, an author named Neil P- Postman. And he talks about, it, the, and the title is called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Oh. And he, he talks about how because of the, t- the television is, and this is, I think, before the internet, if I remember correctly, but mm. that it's numbing our minds mm-hmm. and that we're just constantly like looking for the next thing, looking for the next thing, and how the news like cycles re- realize this. Yes. And it kind of, it's the whole beginning of how all this uh, news cycle, new journalism, um, the internet, like how they play off of that to realize, oh, if I can, if I can get, make them... Uh, pick up that phone one more time. If I can make them turn on that TV one more t- for 30 more minutes. Mm-hmm. A- and a psychological, how we end up going numb and we don't use you know media as a tool, but just as a, a numbness or an escape from reality. Sure. Um, it's a really interesting book, especially because it was before the internet. Yeah, and I think books like that help keep us alert. And we've talked about this before on mm-hmm. one of these episodes helps keep us alert to the need to make our technology be our tool and not it become our master. Mm-hmm. Um, we were having a meeting today uh, as part of our next pastoral plan, and uh, some of the people at the meeting were uh, joking around with um, AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah if I'm saying all that right, right, right yeah. on the internet. And I was asking them how that worked or how did they access that or whatever. And they asked whatever the portal was, uh, they asked it to, I think the question, they framed it somehow like this. What would a homily by Bishop Condrela on Jesus as Lord look like or sound like or whatever? And then this thing actually produced a homily, and it was so amazing, uh, a little weird. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, weird because it was pretty good. Mm-hmm. So somehow it went into all of the Internet and found written things out of articles or homilies or things that are out there in the Internet that I've done related to that topic, pulled them together in a fairly grammatically correct way and put them there. And I thought, oh, my, that is wild. That is wild. A little scary. Now, I had read a book, again, back during COVID, I had read a book called, um, what was it called? It was called The Cloud Revolution, The Cloud Revolution. And the author was exploring uh, the, the fact that in the past, where we've had large cultural, social, economic leaps forward, there is evidence that there have usually been three things associated with that. One had to do with knowledge, one had to do with technology, and one had to do with, I think, economic theory or political theory or something. And it was looking at our present circumstance and recognizing that with the advent of the cloud, the Internet cloud, and all of the technology associated with that, we're poised for another one of these uh, jumps forward. And one of the things that, that I took away from that book that was so amazing to me was the amount of energy that that kind of computational power takes. And so for all of our concern about uh, electric cars and green energy and saving the planet and all of that, um, the very people who are the most jazzed about that 
are the ones who are using the internet the most mm -hmm. and not realizing that, you know, all, all of our tech, our, our new technologies like uh, Lyft, Uber, Grubhub, um, all of those kinds of things, Amazon and ordering things off of Amazon and all of that kind of thing. And now AI, all of those things for them to work require tremendous amounts of data. And that data is coming from warehouse-sized computers spread all over the place. And those computers burn up a tremendous amount of electricity, which I did not, I did not realize that. I hadn't thought that about that. So it was fascinating to, to uh, learn that. Hmm. And uh, so anyway, I forget how we went, <laughs> what took us down this tangent. Hey, that's all right. That's all right. But um, let me let me throw out another one at you. At yeah, you yeah. See, see, what, see what your thoughts are. This is one that's uh, I, I found very beneficial. Uh, not only it's, it's written as a business book, but I found it very beneficial even in uh, if you were a, a parish leader of some sort, uh, if you diocesan leader of some sort. The book is called Start with Why. And, and the, uh, by author Simon Sinek, W H Y. Start with yeah. Start with why. And and the whole concept is is, is to stop before we, like as we're moving things forward to stop and say like well why are we doing this? Well, yes, what is the purpose? Naturally, a cynic would want to know. Yeah. <laughs> would be asking with, why? Question. Yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So I, I but it's it's a really fascinating book because uh, he's a business uh, guru and he, he does this with all he goes and speaks he's had TED talks and he's gone and speak. Uh, uh, had talks at Google and uh, Apple and Amazon. Like he's, he goes all over the place to talk about this and mm -hmm. talk to business leaders. And he just, he stops and says like, what is our purpose? And how do we stick to that purpose? Sure. Um, I've used that even in, in the communications department because there's a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. A lot of things. Yeah. Right. You know, and so you have to stop and say, no, no, no. Who are we trying to focus on? We're trying to focus right. on those in the pews, those who aren't in the pews but should be in the pews, and then everybody else who will be in the pews someday. Yeah. Those are the people we're, we're trying to communicate to. Right. Um, so it's a really good book. And then, the, and then another one I wanted to throw out there that's a non non Catholic book um, that I really like. I like uh, biographies and, and autobiographies mm -hmm. as well, especially with, with historical figures. Mm -hmm. uh, a really good one that I, I enjoyed on uh, Winston Churchill. Oh yeah, it's called uh, "Hero of the Empire" by mm -hmm. Candace Millard, and it goes through his like earlier years uh, up into um, uh, being uh, going into World War II. Right. Um, it's it's a really fascinating book, and all of the trials and tribulations that he had that he went through, and almost a lot of death. You know, he almost had near, near death experiences, and yes, um, almost everybody in England had. Uh, yeah, I guess every <laughs> almost everybody in England. Yeah. That's true, but that's another really good one. I thought um, if yeah. you like, if you're into biographies and historical figures, and of course, many people that are listening or that would listen to this uh, are people who would love to read more, but they literally don't have time. I mean, right. they're up in the morning, they're going to work, they're working, they're driving home, they're taking care of the family and the kids. So, and uh, so, not to overlook. Uh, e-books or, or uh, audio books. Audio books, yeah, yeah. Uh, I listen to, you know, I drive around a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, I listen to lots of audio books. Uh, I listen to Spanish podcasts. One of the ways oh. that I keep my ear, keep trying to develop my ear for understanding spoken Spanish is through Spanish podcasts. Hmm. Um, I have found that YouTube has videos of C.S. Lewis books. Oh, yes. The videos themselves are interesting because they're somehow they're done. You're watching a screen and you're seeing a hand, or at least the pen. I don't remember if the hand is there, but it's a black screen and you're seeing a hand come onto the black screen writing white lines and drawing things that the narrator is saying mm -hmm. while the narrator is saying them. So the scene is developing before your eyes. It's being drawn. Mm -hmm. But it's books that C.S. Lewis has written or G.K. Chesterton. And um, really interesting uh, 
to to listen to. You don't even have to watch the screen. You can right. turn the screen just, off, just but you're just to listening it. to the book in in the car. Uh, when I've had to, you know, if I drive to our seminary at uh, St. Minerids, for yeah. example, it's uh-huh. a six hour drive. Right. You can knock out some good audiobooks at that point. Yeah, that's an excellent way to listen to some good content. Okay, so I got to throw out two Catholic books for audiobooks. Oh, that, uh-huh. that I think are really good. The first one is on the life of Mother Angelica hmm. uh, by Raymond Arroyo. And oh, okay. He does the voice <laughs> of, of Mother Angelica, and it's hilarious. I mean, it, it, it's really well done because uh, yeah. you know he spent a ton of time with Mother Angelica, right. so he really has got her her wit and just kind of her sassiness uh, down <laughs> really well. Um, and it just talks about her whole life as she, you know, here's a here's a nun, a contemplative nun who start, you know, kind of accidentally starts a, a TV station and a a Catholic TV station and a Catholic radio station all across the world, and uh, some of her trials and tribulations that mm. that involved. And then the other one I really liked, uh, I finished recently, is a uh, story of the story of a soul oh. by Saint Therese of Lisieux. Yeah, like they have a a great audio book on that, um, and it just goes just how beautiful of a life. And, and how how much suffering that she went through mm-hmm. in her life, but she desire almost desired that suffering to offer it back up up to our Lord and for souls here on earth. Sure, yeah. Um, so that's an, that's another good one. What's been one of your uh, favorite Catholic audio books? Um, I was surprised to discover I had bought the audio book Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, mm. and. This is a book that I first encountered in literary tradition in seminary. And it's a, it's a really neat book coming out of the Middle Ages about a man who, who encounters a magical green knight, and they have a contest, and he lops off his head. And the green knight lets him do it. He says, you, you can lop off my head. And then he says, but you have to let me return the blow next year. We're going to meet again a year from now, and you have to... So the Green Knight survives. He lops off his head. The Green Knight picks the head up. (laughs) And then he's talking through his lopped-off head. And so now you have to let me return the blow next year, blah, blah, blah. And so that sets up what is a challenge against the Knight's chivalry and against his modesty and against his chastity. Hmm. Uh, because he has to go on this quest to find the Green Knight, to stand for the blow, and it's a critique, in a way, against the whole Arthurian uh, uh, motifs of chivalry and knight's valor and all this kind of stuff. It's just to show, look, you guys say that you're all this, but you're really just human like the rest of us. Right. So pretty interesting book by itself. But I didn't know, and attached to the audiobook was a poem, a larger poem called Pearl. Hmm. And it's a poem about a man who loses a daughter. Uh, she dies when she's very young, and he has this dream, and he goes to heaven and he finds her, and they have this conversation. And it's a really fascinating uh, and beautiful poem that I did not know even existed. Hmm. Uh, Pearl was the name of it. But uh, yeah, so those are fun books. Yeah. Uh, I've enjoyed those. So I think the the, the kind of the moral of the, uh, 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 of of the this, story. Uh, 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 yeah, the moral <laughs> of the story, the moral of, uh, of this podcast is, is one, you know, it, it's good for children to read books. It's good for, for all of us. For all of us to read books. Mm-hmm. It's an opportunity for family time, quality family time to gather around. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot, right? Yeah. It doesn't have, you don't have to, read a whole lot together five ten minutes um after dinner together before dinner you know mm-hmm. something like that uh it's a great opportunity for grandparents to connect with grandchildren um and it, it and it's good for the imagination to, uh, throughout the summertime when school isn't isn't in session right so yeah. uh any last thoughts you, ha- you have before we, we no, close that, for the week no i think that's that's all good there's there's naturally a tendency among people of a certain age uh <laughs> To say, back in my day, everything we did was better or everything was done right. Blah, blah, blah. But I think there are some, some natural human uh, realities, one of which is the children ought to be out playing. 
mm-hmm. uh, too much staying in the house and too much being parked in front of screens is not good for their development. Mm-hmm. And so finding ways to get them interested in things outside of the house or in the yard or those kinds of things, I think, can be very beneficial. That's right. So uh, if you could, leave us a review uh, on, you can check your, out any podcast. Or your favorite books. Or, yeah, let us know what your favorite books are. Yeah, shoot us an email or, or go to our Facebook page and let us know kind of what your favorite favorite books are. We have little clips of Tulsa Time on our Instagram page and on our Facebook page. So be sure to check those out and you can you can leave us a review and, and let us know what books you're reading for the summertime. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for hanging out with us today and we'll see you next week. <laughs>